Hi everyone, my name is Kerry Nanchenberg, and like Daniel, I'm a computer security nerd. Daniel and I both gave talks at the SwissNex event in San Francisco last month, and he thought it might be fun for you to see my talk about the early days of computer viruses. So here it is, I hope you enjoy it. So my talk is called The Early Days of Antivirus, and this is a view from the Norton Antivirus Lab. And again, my name is Kerry Natchenberg, and I'm a fellow, which is like the chief engineer at Symantec. Uh, and also, I'm an adjunct professor at UCLA, where I teach uh, freshman computer science. So, what was my introduction to computer viruses? Well, back in 1992, I was a UCLA, probably about a junior then. And uh, this is what I look like. I'm a guy on the left. Uh, that's what computers looked like back then. Boy, they were really big. And I was doing an internship at Symantec for the summer. And uh, at the time, I was working in the computer virus lab. Now, back then, computer viruses were, were quite unusual. Um, in fact, they were considered an urban myth by no, none other than Peter Norton. He actually said the computer virus is an urban myth. It's like the history of the crocodiles in the sewers of New York. All the world knows of them, but no one, nobody has seen them. And in fact, that was really the case. Computer viruses were not that prevalent uh, on, a, on, a, on a bad day, or a good day, I don't know, depends on how you look at it. Uh, uh, in the virus lab, we might receive 10 to 15 new samples from customers or from other security researchers that we would analyze. And most people in the world had never even experienced them. Of course, today, as we fast forward, uh, and we'll talk about this later, there are literally hundreds of millions of new threats per year. But back then, they were very rare. They were considered an urban myth. So what is a computer virus? Well, um, I want to give you a fundamental understanding of actually what they are and how they work. So let's do a little primer. First, let's start out with a background on what a computer program is. Not a virus, but a normal computer program. So a normal computer program, uh, like Word for Windows or Excel or your favorite video game, is a type of file with a series of instructions that tells the computer how to solve a particular problem. So, for instance, if you had a calculator program on your computer and you were to click on that calculator program with your mouse, uh, the program, the software instructions, might look like this. Now, this is obviously a simplification. Uh, your computer really wouldn't understand instructions that look like this, but this will hopefully help you understand how a computer program actually works. So here you see we have this program called calc.exe. Exe is the name of files that run on your computer. They're you know, program files. And the first instruction obviously is, says print enter your first number, the second instruction says get a number from the user, and so on. And so you can see there are a bunch of instructions that the computer can follow one after the other. And computers are actually pretty stupid. All they do is follow these instructions that they're given one at a time from top to bottom. So let's see how this might work. So the first instruction says print enter your first number, and that would be printed to the screen because the computer simply follows the instructions. The next instruction says get a number from the user. So the computer follows that and waits for the user to type a number. And once the user types a number, it stores it away. The third instruction says enter your second number, prints it out to the screen. So the user enters their next number on the next line here, line four. They type a nine. And then uh, line five here says add the two numbers together. So it adds the two numbers together, gets 26. And then it prints the resulting sum. So you can see that a computer program is just a simple set of instructions. Now this is a simplification, but every program, whether it be Word for Windows or, or your favorite video game, is basically just a combination of millions or billions of these instructions. So that's, that's how computers work. So what is a computer virus? Well, a computer virus is a, is a series of computer instructions that can automatically copy themselves from one computer program to another computer program. It's that simple. A set of instructions that copy themselves. They're self-replicating. Now, here we have our calculator program that we saw earlier, and the calculator program is in black. So look at the black lines. Those are the lines that actually comprise our original calculator program. The red lines are actually instructions that are part of a computer virus that was somehow added to uh, this original calc program. And what you can see is that a computer virus actually infects a legitimate program. It actually adds itself on. So let's see how this might work. First of all, we would call the, the black lines, the original program that's legitimate, that does something useful for the user, the host program. Okay? And we call the, obviously, the red instructions, the computer virus. So, of course, back then you'd get these computer viruses on floppy disks. Uh, and if you were to run a program on your floppy disk, for instance, like uh, calc.exe or, or pacman or something, let's run pacman. 
Remember how, how it used to sound, if you remember from those days? Okay, so you run, let's say, Pac-Man, it will run uh, the program. Now, in this case, as you can see, Pac-Man has both legitimate instructions as well as inf the virus infection instructions. So let's see what happens. Let's follow the instructions one at a time. So the first instruction says go to step 100. So the virus is actually seizing control. It's, it's not letting the original program, the black instructions run that runs a Pac-Man game. It's actually jumping to step 100, which is the viral logic. The virus then has an instruction that says locate a new program on disk. So the computer basically goes and searches for another program on disk and it says, ooh, there's a new program called calculator.exe on disk and it finds it. And there's a calculator that we saw earlier. Next, line 101 of the viral logic says, insert the line, go to step 100 at the top of the new file. So the computer, of course, doesn't know what it's doing. It just follows the instructions. And what you can see is that our calculator program has been modified so that it has a new instruction at the top of its file above the legitimate instructions. And this is a viral instruction, which is why it's in red. Line 102 uh, says, append lines 100 through 104 from this file, and you can see those lines right now, the arrow's pointing to 102 of, of the five lines there. Um, it's, it says append these lines onto the end of the new file. So the viral logic actually copies itself to the new file, okay? Next, what the virus does is it checks the date, and this is called a payload. A payload is when a computer virus or other threat checks, for instance, some trigger criteria like the date or time or what users log in and then decides to do something bad like format the hard drive if a particular criterion is met. So in this case, it's checking to see if it's January 1st, which it's not, um, but if it was, it might format the hard drive. And finally, the virus basically returns control to the original host program so the host program can run without the user even knowing anything happened because the instructions that we see here, 100 through 104, actually happen in a fraction of a second. It happens very quickly. So the virus transfers control back to step two, which is the original program. The user is none the wiser because all of these viral infection steps happened in a fraction of a second. And what all the user will see on the screen is something like this, welcome to Pac-Man. The next instruction will run, which says play music, pacman.wave. And in fact, if you actually could hear what I'm hearing, it would actually play the Pac-Man uh, sound. Okay, and then it'll display a maze on the screen. It might look something like that. And the rest of the game would run normally. And you would never even know that something happened. Now, if we look at the two programs that we, uh, uh, that the, the, the Pac-Man program on the left that started out infected and the calculator program on the right that became infected, what you'll notice is that in fact, the viral infection logic was exactly the same. Okay, the, the instructions that comprise the virus actually are literally exactly identical. And so this virus will spread exact, exact replicas of itself from file to file on your hard drive. Okay, even though the host programs will all be different, the viral instructions themselves will be the same. Now this was, this is an example of a very simple virus. And in fact, if I ever, uh, you know, post another video on Dan's uh, YouTube site, I, I might talk about, for instance, how these viruses polymorph themselves or, or hid themselves because uh, the later iterations of these viruses would actually uh, basically mutate themselves in order to avoid detection. But this, these two copies of the same virus are obviously identical. Now, how would we cure these things? Well, we would use fingerprints, of course. So just like a human fingerprint, uh, every computer virus has a fingerprint of its own and we can actually look for those in order to identify uh, viruses that we know about uh, where we've already seen their fingerprint. So how would that work usually? Well, way back in the day, uh, we would receive computer viruses from customers who were infected. And so what might happen to the user? Well, imagine if they were visiting a bulletin board. Back in the early 1990s, we had things called bulletin boards where people basically ran some software in their computer that would allow other people to connect up over the phone and exchange emails and download files and so on. It was point to point, just one computer to the other back at the time. And a user like our friend here might have connected to one of those bulletin boards and gotten a computer virus on our computer. Now, unfortunately, maybe it was a new strain of the virus and the security software, in this case, maybe the Norton software, wouldn't have detected it because we you know, missed uh, these new strains. They were designed to evade computer security software. And so somehow the user would know that something was going on, that there was something wrong with their computer. Uh, for instance, they might have seen something like this on their screen. This is actually 
a screenshot of the ambulance virus, which you've probably seen before on Dan's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this computer virus, when it activated, when its payload activated, would display an ambulance on the screen over and over and over and over again. So the user is now freaking out and they say, well, I've got a problem. I'm going to send it in uh, for analysis to a security company. And so what would happen back then is the user would actually copy the suspect file over to a floppy disk and stick it inside of a disk mailer. Okay, And they would send that over to the security company like Symantec uh, over US Postal Service. Now back then, literally, we would go into the mailroom and there would be a stack of new disk mailers, floppy disk mailers that were recently delivered by the US Post Office for us to analyze. And we'd each take one and start analyzing them. It was somehow interesting, actually, that somehow there were no computer viruses ever written on Sundays. I wonder why that was. Okay, that was a joke. It's because the Postal Service actually doesn't deliver mail on Sundays. But um, the rest of the days, actually, we would get new computer viruses in the mail. So once we got the new computer virus, we'd have a human actually take a look at the file. They would actually analyze the file, look at all of its instructions and so on by hand. Now back then it was possible to do this because we received maybe 10 to 15 new computer viruses per day. If you fast forward to today, of course we have far more than computer viruses. We have targeted attacks, state-sponsored attacks, spyware, ransomware, lots of different types of attacks, phishing attacks and so on. Uh, today we have about 300 million new threats that are discovered per year um, and we analyze about 99.99% of them automatically with intelligent computer systems. But back then, with 10 to 15 new comp computer viruses per day, we had humans doing all the work, literally people like me, interns and, and uh, full-time people. So what would we do? Well, the first thing we would do is take a copy of the file that was sent to us on the floppy disk and do what's called the disassembly. This is basically taking the program and getting a list of all the instructions in the file, the computer instructions. Okay, So we would actually focus on the computer instructions for the viral code, for the specific instructions that were part of the virus, not the host program. Because frankly, we didn't care how Pac-Man worked. We cared how the virus worked. Now. When we would look at these instructions, we would look at them in a representation or a form called assembly language. So we would take a, what's called a disassembler, which is a piece of software that takes your viral program, the virally infected program, and converts it to this assembly language on the right-hand side. This assembly language is actually a programming language that computer nerds like me uh, know how to use in order to write software. It's a very complex language. It's called a low-level language. But this is the way that we would analyze these threats. So um, after a while, you learn how to read these instructions on the right here, and they make more sense to you. Um, if you look at these now, they actually make very little sense at all, right? They're, they're obviously gobbledygook. It looks very confusing. But pretty soon, if you look at enough of these things, you, you actually can figure out what they mean and what they do and, and you know, how they control the virus. So uh, we look at these instructions uh, that were extracted from the virus and try to identify uh, in all of these instructions a little contiguous sequence of instructions that were really interesting, that were very unique to the virus logic itself. In other words, uh, in a computer virus, it has lots of instructions. Some of the instructions might print something to the screen. Some of the instructions might try to format your hard drive. Some of the instructions might try to copy the virus from file to file. We wanted to identify the, a unique ser series of instructions that would only be found in this computer virus and never found inside legitimate software. Okay. Um, uh, we would call this a signature. In other words, these would be the instructions that are unique to this threat that if we search for these instructions, we'll find them only in one place, only if a file is infected by this virus. Okay. So once we analyze this assembly language, these instructions in this assembly language uh, that, we, that, that we translated the virus into so we could understand it, uh, well, guess what? We had to write a fingerprint. But the reality is that, in fact, computers don't speak assembly language. Computer systems, you know, computers like your Intel computer, actually don't understand this language that we have here on the left. This is actually a human readable language, as hard as that is to believe, but computers actually speak in numbers. So a computer program is really just a bunch of numbers. Uh, there might be one or more or two or three or four or five numbers for every instruction. Uh, for instance, the 81EB0010 might mean, you know, move the value EB0010 from one place in the computer to another place in the computer. So basically each of these sets of numbers tells the computer how to do one computer instruction. Okay, So what we had to do is we had to actually 
understand the underlying numbers that made up the computer virus, not the stuff on the left-hand side here, which is what we can read, but the actually underlying numbers that are the equivalent of that, and that's what we'd use for our fingerprint. Okay, so we had what was called a fingerprint database, which was just a big data file with lots of computer virus fingerprints in it. And for each computer virus, we'd have the name of the virus, like Cascade, and then a signature for the virus, which is a bunch of numbers. Okay, uh, and so for instance, as we analyze this new computer virus that was sent in by the customer, we would extract this unique sequence of numbers from the file that corresponded to the red instructions here on the left, the ones that we thought were uniquely associated with the virus, okay? We give the virus a name, in this case maybe we call the virus name hijack, and that was a lot of fun because we got to name the viruses ourselves. And then what we do is we take that signature, 81EB dot 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 dot, and we add that to the data file, okay? So what we would have is a, a new virus fingerprint database with one new virus fingerprint added to it, and we might add 5 or 10, 15 new computer virus fingerprints per day to that data file. So once we'd analyzed the computer virus, we'd understood its assembly language instructions, we'd identified the corresponding machine language instructions, those numbers, we'd added those numbers of the machine language instructions, the actual virus instructions, uh, to our data file, we would then take that data file, stick it on a floppy disk again, okay, stick it in a floppy disk mailer, and then send it over US Postal Service to the customer that submitted the virus, okay? And so the customer would receive in the mail, US Postal Service in their mailbox, <laughs> a floppy disk mailer which they would open up, and they'd st stick that floppy disk into their computer, they'd install the update, uh, the updated data file that we sent them, which had the fingerprint, the ones and zeros, the, the numbers associated with that computer virus. And then our antivirus software, our security software, would then scan through each file on the user's computer looking for the sequence of numbers, okay, like these. This is basically these instructions here in 100 through 104 are actually really, really represented as numbers in this file. That's what the computer understands. We'd look for those numbers, and if we found them, we'd kill them, remove them from the file, and re restore the original file so that only the original uh, legitimate program would be left over after we did the removal and the virus would be removed from the computer system. So that's sort of how it worked back then. It was all manual, humans looking at these viruses, creating disassemblies, identifying the machine language instructions, adding it to the fingerprint databases and so on. So uh, after a couple years I actually started working full-time at Symantec and I want to tell you about another type of computer virus. Um, the macrovirus. Now, you might think a macrovirus is just a big computer virus, but in fact, it's a special type of virus that infects documents and spreadsheets and, for instance, PowerPoint presentations instead of traditional program files like Pac-Man that we saw earlier. And in July of 95, we saw the first macrovirus, which was called Concept, because it was a proof of concept, probably. We don't know who actually created this thing. And this virus infected documents. So, how does a macrovirus work? Well, of course, here we have a copy of Word for Windows, uh, or you know, a screenshot from Word for Windows. And you might have a document, like a strategic plan or something. Now, you might not realize it, but every document actually has the ability to, to contain a series of things called macros. And here we go. You can see this document, if you were to peel back the the surface of the document, inside every document, you can have macros. And here are three macros. Okay. Now a macro is a little program just like we saw in the previous example. It's a set of instructions that tells the computer how to do something. And in this case, as you can see, a given document can actually have multiple programs embedded in it. In this case, three different programs, each with their own different instructions. So what might these instructions look like? Well, let's look at this thing called auto open. Auto open is a special macro in Word for Windows, which automatically runs any time you open a new document. So if you were to open this document, strategic plan document, then uh, this macro, this program would run within your computer. So what does this auto open macro look like if it were legitimate, for instance? Well, it's a macro that says run the following instructions anytime the user opens this document in Word. And here are the instructions. First of all, pop up a window stating this is a confidential document. Do not copy. Okay, so that's useful. Maybe you would want to put this little program in your documents, all your confidential documents, so anytime somebody opens them up, you can remind them, hey, this is confidential, don't share it. Line two says, 
Disable cut and paste from this document. So that's something you might want to do for a confidential document is prevent anybody from cutting and pasting uh, from the document. And line three says flag this document as read only to prevent modifications. So as you can see, this macro, which is a little program, has effectively three instructions that run anytime you open this document. Okay? Now, of course, uh, as we saw earlier, computer viruses are simply programs that self-replicate. So could you have a self-replicating macro uh, uh, as well? And the answer is yes. So what if we had the following instructions in our macro? Line one, enumerate all documents that are currently open in Word for Windows and copy my auto open macro, that's the one where the little arrow is pointing to, and that's the macro that's open now, and copy the payload macro into each of those documents. Line two, if the date is July 28th, run the payload macro. Well, guess what? July 28th in this case would be the payload uh, date for this threat, and in this case it would run the payload macro. So let's look at the payload macro. Let's open up and see what it might look like. And as you can see, the payload macro here, let's see, basically says run the following instructions only when instructed to do so by another macro. Line one, pop up a window saying happy birthday, Carrie. Line two, play happy birthday dot wave. Okay, so these two macros together comprise a computer virus that will copy itself from document to document. They're actually two separate programs, uh, but they work together in tandem. So let's see how this might work. Okay. So imagine a user goes into Word for Windows and decides to open a new document, an infected document. Okay, so they go and they click open. And there we go, we see the infected document there. Of course, it probably wouldn't be called infected, but uh, it's sort of an obvious cue there, but let's assume it wasn't called infected. And you can see the document's been opened. Now again, as I said, this document actually has a potential to contain macros inside of it. And let's look, oop, there are macros inside of this document. Okay, so. The first thing that happens is the auto open macro will automatically run because it runs anytime you open a document that contains the auto open macro. And there it is. And as we saw, it runs the following instructions when the document is open. So it says enumerate, go through all documents that are currently open for Word. As you can see, there are two documents also that are open for Word on the right hand side. So the macro virus will effectively take a look at this first document in the upper right hand corner. It then copies a copy of its auto open macro and payload macro into the new document. So it takes those macros, it copies it from its own document into the new document, all without you seeing it. This happens in the background in literally microseconds or milliseconds. Okay, and then it closes everything up. Then it goes and says enumerate the next document. So it finds the other document that you have open in Word for Windows. And then it copies, as you can see, that document currently doesn't have any, any macros right now, but the, the macro virus copies, again, the two macros, auto open and payload, into the new document. And then it closes it up. And as you can see, now all three documents are infected with the same computer virus. It actually spread an exact copy of itself, as we saw before. Finally, the macro virus tries to run its payload, checks to see if the date is July 28th, which it isn't, and then uh, it just skips this because it's not. But otherwise, it would run the payload macro, which would, you know, play happy birthday. So now you see how a computer virus, a macro virus rather, works. It's interesting to see that these viruses did not just uh, impact programs like video games and so on. They could actually impact documents as well. So, of course, I have to make this a little bit racy. So one question is, is it possible to have macro virus sex. Virus sex, is that really possible for computer viruses to mate and procreate? Well, guess what? It is. So here I have a virus called the kit virus. And you can see it has two macros, the auto open macro and the payload macro. Here I have another virus, or not another document, that is infected with a second virus called the caboodle virus. And you can see it has two macros, but they're different. One's the payload macro, it's sort of hidden there. And the second macro is called the on close macro, which is a macro that would normally run only when a document is closed. So the question is, can these two computer viruses and two different documents somehow mate? Of course, that would be censored. I don't know if I can really show you that. It's a little bit, little bit inappropriate for YouTube. All right, but I will. Okay, so let's see what might happen if uh, these two viruses were to get it on. Okay, so 
Anytime I open a document, for instance, uh, here we have a third document that's not infected. Let's imagine that my first virus runs. And the first virus, as you recall, will copy its two macros over to other documents that are open in Word for Windows. Okay, so it will copy its two macros open. The second computer virus will similarly copy its two macros op open when it, when it activates. In this case, the second virus will activate when the document is closed, but it'll still activate, and it will copy its two macros over to the new document. And so what you can see is that our new document actually contains one macro from the kit virus, the auto-open macro, and it contains two macros from the caboodle virus, okay, the on-close macro and the payload macro. Okay? So it's in some sense a hybrid of both the kit vi virus and the caboodle virus. Now imagine I opened an entirely new document uh, that is not infected. Okay? If we were to now run the auto-open macro in our newly infected document on the bottom here, let's see what it does. Well, it says enumerate all documents that are currently open in Word. Well, there you go. There's a document that's open in Word. Okay, has no macros in it right now. Then we'll copy the auto open and payload macros into the new document. So watch this. See the auto open and payload macros on the bottom there? Well, those will be copied into the new document. Only notice that actually one macro from each of the original viruses has been copied into this new document. It's not either the kit virus or the caboodle virus, it actually has both elements, okay? So it has caboodle's payload macro from the caboodle virus, it has kit's auto open macro, it's actually a new hybrid computer virus that actually contains little programlets or macros from both of the original computer viruses, we might want to call it the whole kit and caboodle virus. Now you might think that this would happen very rarely in the real world. In other words, how often would computer viruses mate like this? But in fact, at the time in the early 1990s, you know, mid 1990s, we would see this happen all the time where we would get a hybrid virus that literally happened to be created through mating on one of our customers' computers in the field. And this was a real problem because it created lots of new variants that the people who originally wrote these computer viruses never anticipated. They never expected that these things would mate, and in fact they did, and created thousands and thousands of new variants that were unforeseen. Now finally, I'm almost done, I want to tell you one last uh, fun and uh, true story. So again, back in 1992, maybe it was 1993, uh, I was, when I was in the virus lab analyzing these computer viruses, we got a letter from Tibet, not a letter, well it was a letter and a floppy disk in one of these mailers from Tibet. And I think that's actually a Tibetan stamp, I cut and paste that on there from Google, so it must be right. Um, and it was sent to us at, uh, at Symantec, and so we had to analyze it. And inside the, the uh, floppy disk mailer from Tibet was of course a floppy disk. It didn't say from Tibet, but I'm just trying to make this very clear for you. Um, so the letter that came with the, uh, the diskette said that this diskette had a computer virus which would destroy the hardware of the computer. So in other words, they said that if you stick this floppy disk into your computer floppy disk drive, it will literally destroy the floppy disk drive, it will stop working altogether. Now, I knew at the time that that was impossible because it was impossible for a software computer virus, just a bunch of instructions, to actually destroy the hardware of the computer. It was not feasible, it was not possible. And so of course, as a, as a, a, a young intern in the, in the uh, semantic lab, I took the floppy disk, ignored the, uh, the letter that was sent to me from Tibet, and stuck it into my uh, floppy disk drive. And that's what my computer actually looked like. Uh, so I stuck the disk in the disk drive, and the disk seemed bad. It didn't seem like it was working. It was obviously maybe a corrupted disk, you know, it, for whatever reason the data was corrupt. So I said, okay, I'm going to stick in another floppy disk. I removed this floppy disk, my from Tibet disk from my disk drive. I stuck in another floppy disk that had some of my tools, my antivirus tools, to help me look at the disk and see what was actually going on on it. I stuck it into the drive, and it wouldn't work. And I tried another floppy disk in the same drive, and it wouldn't work. And I thought to myself, oh my god, is it possible that there's a hardware-destroying computer virus uh, that actually would take out a, a floppy disk in a computer? Uh, floppy disk drive, rather. So I said, it couldn't be. It really can't, can't possibly be. So what do I do? Of course, like a, a good experimenter, I took the floppy disk from Tibet and I stuck it in the other disk drive. Um, because, of course, I just had to check because how could it possibly be that a floppy disk could destroy a disk drive? And guess what? 
uh, the, the floppy disk didn't work in this drive, this drive either. And as I tried my other floppy diskettes from, with all my tools on them, my antiviral tools, none of them worked either. They all stopped working after I inserted this disk into the computer. And I thought to myself, oh my God, we found the first hardware destroying computer virus. How is it possible? What could this possibly do? Just sticking a floppy disk in a computer, how could that possibly take out the disk? Disk drive, both disk drives. I mean, it was literally, how could this be? It was, I couldn't believe it. Finally, I figured out what it was. In fact, the Tibetan virus turned out to be a bit of honey or maybe jam, maybe jelly, I'm not exactly sure on the floppy disk surface itself, which was basically gunking up the uh, disk drives. So in fact, this is the first hardware infecting virus that I know of, and let's call it the honey virus. Sort of funny, right? I mean, it was actually a true story. Uh, and I did trash two different floppy drives. Anyway, so you've heard a little bit about my time from the early 1990s uh, in the Semantic Virus Lab, uh, a little bit about some uh, virus sex. I hope you enjoyed it. And finally, um, you probably heard about this before. There was another video that Dan posted, but I just wanted to share with you in case you're interested. I did write a computer novel. Uh, it's actually a thriller with a little bit of technology added, a little cybersecurity angle. It's called The Florentine Deception. And uh, it's sort of like Da Vinci Code meets uh, CSI Cyber, uh, but a little bit more realistic. And I'm donating everything to charity. So if you're interested in taking a look, pick up a copy. It's only about five bucks on Amazon.com. Okay. Hope you enjoyed my talk.